Okay, so here we have a rod cell, we have the bipolar cell, and we have our sensory neuron here. Okay, and go light is going to be moving in this direction. Okay, our sequence of events, our story that results in the generation of an or a series of depolarizations that eventually results in a, <clears throat> uh, well, actually, well, with the, the sequence of events that's going to result in an action potential in the sensory neuron essentially is going to happen this way. Okay? So, light going this way, story going that way. Okay? So, let's begin. Now, in the dark, <clears throat> Because in the dark, we need to understand what the situation is that results in the sensory neuron not having action potentials. But then we need to see how photons of light cause that situation to change. And so we have impulses moving down the sensory neuron. So in the dark, the situation is like so that you have... Um, sodium being or diffusing in here into the cell um, and it's being actively transported out here okay so uh, ATP is used there and sodium is being pumped out of here but there's an open channel here that allow sodium to come back in. Now, because of this situation, whereas normally we might expect a cell to be polarized and, and be around about minus 70 millivolts, the rod cell maintains itself at around minus 40. Okay, because some sodium is being allowed to come in, whereas, remember, normally, sodium is not coming in unless there is depolarization occurring. So normally these cells are um, slightly depolarized. They depolarize essentially all the time. Because they're depolarized all the time, <clears throat> what happens is that the uh, synaptic vesicles at uh, this end of the cell are always being are always fusing with the membrane. So in the dark, the cell, because of the situation with the so some of the sodium uh, being allowed in, because of that, um, this cell is said to be con in a constant state of depolarization in the dark. Because of that. The constant state of depolarization, the synaptic vesicles are always fusing, and neurotransmitter is always being released out of these cells. The neurotransmitter that is released is not acetylcholine, it is glutamate, and the, the important thing about this neurotransmitter is that it acts in an inhibitory way on the bipolar cells. So we've talked about synapses, we've discussed that whereas some synapses can be excitatory, other ones can be inhibitory, and this is an example of an inhibitory synapse. So glutamate is the neurotransmitter, it's always released because this cell is always depolarized when it is dark. So in the absence of any stimulation, this neurotransmitter is constantly being released. It is a little bit counterintuitive. So glutamate is released when it binds to the postsynaptic uh, membrane. It causes hyper hyperpolarization of the bipolar cell. So when this cell is hyperpolarized, it is. So when it's hyperpolarized, it's going to be very negative inside the cell, and when it's hyperpolarized, it is not going to release neurotransmitter to cause an action potential in the sensory neuron. 
So we see how that in the dark, the system results in no action potentials moving down the sensory neuron. Okay? And that is that. And if you didn't get that, just rewind it and uh, start again, right? Okay, now, now what we'll do is look at when light is present, how the situation changes. So light is now arriving, what happens is that rhodopsin, so in these membrane-bound sacs, the pigment rhodopsin is there. Uh, the pigment rhodopsin is there, so rhodopsin is... Um, combination of protein and non-protein component. Remember, proteins by themselves, they can't act as pigments. They need something non-protein to allow them to act as pigment. Okay, so rhodopsin is a, a joining of opsin, which is the protein, Retinal, which is the non-protein component that gives this substance its pigment property, a light absorbing property. Okay, so in these sacs I've got lots of rhodopsin, and when light arrives, the rhodopsin breaks down into opsin and retinal. Now, opsin has got a signaling property that is kind of inhibited or, you know, uh, not possible when it's in this form, but when it's in this form, it has uh, signaling properties, and there's a, a quite a complicated cascade of events that happens. But long story short, when opsin is present, this sodium channel is closed, and so when those channels are closed, the a the active transport of sodium out of the cell is still happening. So sodium is still being removed from the cell, but it is no longer being allowed to come into the cell, and that causes the cell to become hyperpolarized. So remember, in the dark, it was spending most of its time being depolarized because sodium was allowed to come into the cell through the channel. However, um, in the light, so when there's light, and opsin is present, the channel is closed, sodium is not coming in, it is still being removed, this, this cell, the rod cell becomes hyperpolarized. And in the, in the state that is hyperpolarized, then there is nothing causing the synaptic vesicles to fuse with the membrane, and so the glutamate is not released. So when there's light present, glutamate's not released into the synaptic cleft. And if glutamate is not there, then it is not um, inhibiting this, or it's not causing this cell to be hyperpolarized. So remember, that the glutamate was an inhibitory neurotransmitter. When it bound, it allowed negative ions into this cell which caused it to be hyper hyperpolarized okay but if this cell is no longer depolarized it is no longer releasing glutamate the glutamate is no longer allowing chloride ions to come into this cell it is no longer causing this cell to be hyperpolarized so this cell is now getting becoming or allowed to become depolarized. So because this cell can now depolarize, it can now release the neurotransmitter into this synaptic cleft. Okay, and when that happens, it will allow the sodium to enter this sensory neuron and thus begin to generate the actual potential that will start to move down that sensory neuron. Okay, so there's a lot of kind of counterintuitive things going on here that are rooted in your understanding of neurons and how they work, protein channels, movement of ions, release of neurotransmitter, both inhibitory and excitatory.
okay? So I recommend if, if any of that is still confusing, go back to the beginning and listen to that again. And as a good student, if you've still got questions, something is not making sense, don't just accept it, don't ignore it, do something about it. Watch another video, a better video, ask a teacher, ask a friend what's going on, get this thing resolved, okay?